Good morning and welcome. I'm John Coatsworth, Dean of the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. And I want to welcome you to the third lecture in SIPA's uh, Leaders in Global Energy series, the centerpiece of a new initiative launched by SIPA this fall to identify and learn about solutions to the challenge of creating sustainable energy while protecting the environment and reaffirming corporate citizenship. This initiative has been made possible through support by Energias de Portugal, one of Europe's leading electricity operators. I also want to acknowledge and thank SIPA's visiting professor, Manuel Pino, former Portuguese Minister of Economy and Innovation, he's here in the front row, uh, in making, uh, uh, for his uh, initiative and, and his energy in making this series possible. Professor Pino, uh, as you may know, is an extraordinarily versatile individual. <clears throat> he has just reinvented himself again this morning, launching his new career as a test driver for Nissan's new electric car, uh, <laughs> Nissan Leaf. Creating sustainable energy while protecting the environment and reaffirming corporate citizenship is one of the great challenges of this century. The Leaders in Global Energy lecture series is the centerpiece of a new SIPA initiative in this field. The series began this September with a lecture by Nabuo Tanaka, Managing Director of the International Energy Agency. Next, we heard from Andris Pilbax, European Commissioner for Development. And the series will conclude on December 1st with a talk by Fatih Birol, Chief Economist at the International Energy Agency. In addition to the Leaders in Global Energy series, SIPA is developing new coursework, fieldwork, and research through its energy and environment concentration, which provides students with the knowledge base and analytical tools needed uh, to address the challenge of sustainably and responsibly powering the developed and developing nations of the world. SIPA has a unique track record of empowering people to serve the global public interest through careers in the public, nonprofit, and private sectors and through research that points to new forms of collaboration and development. SIPA's ties to the university's Earth Institute, schools of business and law, and departments of economics and political science create an ideal interdisciplinary platform for this initiative. We all know that finding, promoting, and implementing solutions to the challenge of sustainable energy will require collaboration by government, corporate, and NGO leaders. The adoption of new technologies and the rise of a new generation of thinkers who can overcome all the historic barriers to socially responsible energy policy making. That is why we are especially pleased and honored to welcome today Carlos Tavares and his team. As chairman of uh, Nissan Americas, Mr. Tavares graduated from the Ecole uh, Centrale de Paris with a degree in engineering and is a native of Portugal. He oversees Nissan's operations in North, Central, and South America, including manufacturing, engineering, design, sales and marketing, and administration and finance, the whole thing. Before assuming his current responsibilities, Mr. Tavares supervised a number of global functions for the company, including corporate planning, product planning, design brand management, uh, sorry, design and brand management, market intelligence, and the infinity and commercial vehicle businesses. It was under his guidance that Nissan developed its zero emissions strategy and pursued the development of electric vehicles. In only four years, the results are here on the screen, the new Nissan LEAF. Mr. Tavares will speak about the Nissan LEAF and zero emission mobility innovation for the planet. Welcome. Good morning to everybody. <clears throat> and thank you. Thank you very much for hosting us. It's, uh, it's indeed uh, not only a pleasure, uh, also a privilege and an honor to be here with you today. And um, it's absolutely true that uh, we came here to meet with you, discuss with you, interact with you, to talk about a real strategy for a real car with real people. And uh, we, we took the stance of avoiding the uh, 100 slide lecture uh, by bringing the people, the executives, who input the energy in the system 
to make things happen. And those people are here with us today. And uh, you'll see they are quite uh, lively people. And I'm enjoying every day uh, when I have the pleasure again and the privilege to work with them. So I'm just going to start by introducing them. So uh, I will use my documents because their resume is so rich that I could, uh, of course, not memorize that. And uh, I will start by uh, Alfonso, uh, Alfonso Abaisa, the gentleman over here. Uh, he is the, the vice president of Nissan Design America in San Diego, California. Alfonso is responsible for design activities for the Americas region and plays a part in planning future design strategies for the Nissan and Infinity brands. Most recently, Alfonso oversaw the design development of new vehicles, including the Nissan Juke, Altima, Maxima, and Rogue. Alfonso began his career as an automotive designer in 1988, when he joined Nissan as a recent graduate of the Pratt Institute in New York. We have just next to him, Trisha Young. Uh, John Nissen, uh, upon graduating from Harvard Business School in 2002, Tricia is the Director and Chief Marketing Manager of Electric Vehicle Marketing and Sales Strategy, with responsibility for developing a comprehensive strategy for the launch of the Nissan Leaf. Uh, Tricia was recently selected as one of the 100 leading women in the North American auto industry by Automotive News. We have then Mark over there. Um, we call him Dr. Mark. You will understand later why. He's a, a Nissan North America veteran with more than 25 years and numerous roles throughout the sales and marketing organization. But mostly, as I think you'll learn, Mark is an EV guy. Mark drove the Ultra EV in 1992 when he worked on Nissan's first EV, demonstration project in the United States. Mark is the director of product planning responsible for many cars in Nissan's lineup. But for the past two years, he has lived and breathed the Nissan Leaf. Mark is a graduate of Virginia uh, Tech and like several on this stage, began his life as an engineer. We have then uh, David Mingle. Next to him, David is a graduate of the University of Illinois, where he earned both his bachelor and master degrees in economics. He has spent eight years at Nissan and also developed experience outside of the company as president and CEO of Jatco, Jato Dynamics and as president of Chrome Systems Incorporated. Today, David serves at Nissan as senior director, customer management and business strategy where he oversees Nissan North America's customer contact points, including the websites, call centers, and lead management activities. Last but not least, uh, you have Tracy Woodward. Uh, Tracy is the Director of Government Affairs at Nissan, where she has worked as the company's chief lobbyist in the United States for 10 years. Tracy is a graduate of University of Tennessee, EV now takes up well over 100% of her time. So these are the real people who are making it happen. Uh, and before I start describing you a little bit more about our strategy, uh, I would like uh, just to show you a very small video. Introducing the 100% electric Nissan LEAF. Innovation for the planet. 
Innovation for all. I suppose you got it. For Nissan, polar bear was a, a provocative concept that signaled to consumers that Nissan is at a transformative moment in history. The status quo is no more. The environment is hanging in the balance, consumers' priorities are shifting, and transportation is adapting with this changing world. As you can imagine, some found this ad to be polarizing. Uh, Rush uh, Limbo, for example, called the commercial pathetic, adding that Al Gore could have written the thing. He also said that the little kids watching this stuff may think it's okay to hug a polar bear. Uh, we hope that's not the case. On the other hand, USA Today said the ad engages the viewer, then hammers home the message, save the planet one leaf at the time. Other reactions, uh, and there were countless reactions, came from multiple perspectives across the spectrum. But nobody disputes that Nissan made an impact. Nissan believes in making an impact and views zero emission as a once-in-lifetime opportunity. Through zero emissions technology and the electrification of transportation, we can change the automotive industry, the way consumers drive, and how vehicles are brought to market. Our key goal is zero emission leadership. But before there can be leadership, the marketplace needs to be established. Right now, we are in the process of creating that market. What's driving the case for change? A number of key trends are bringing alternative fuel vehicles to the forefront around the globe. The first revolves around demographics. Today, the world's population totals 6.7 billion humans, and by 2050, it will reach over 9 billion. With regards to motor vehicles, today there are 600 million vehicles worldwide on our planet, and by 2050, statistics show that there may be up to 2.5 billion. The World Wildlife Fund has noted that if China catches up to the US standards of consumption, it will require two planets to sustain our livelihood for the long run. And if the rest of the world catches up, it will require 11. In addition, concerns over the environment are reshaping consumer perceptions, priorities, and demands. Consumers are concerned about global warming. For example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has concluded that there will be an increase of 5 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. In addition, our research has revealed that consumers are looking for energy independence. Therefore, Nissan has made a corporate commitment to reduce global CO2 emission by 90%, 90, through 2050. Advanced technology vehicles are a key part of this plan. When Nissan identified the need to achieve this goal, we did not want to take an intermediary step by pursuing a transitional technology. Instead, we focused our energy on the ultimate solution. Does everyone know what this is? <laughs> it's a muffler and a tailpipe. It exists in all internal combustion powered vehicles, all hybrid vehicles, all plug-in hybrids, and all range extenders. There is no tailpipe in a Nissan Leaf because there are no tailpipe emissions this is how we define the ultimate solution. What is even more exciting in that advanced technology is driving new solutions, creating the ultimate conditions to bring to mass produce zero emission vehicles to fruition. Given the magnitude of these changes, it was identified early by the Nissan team that creating a mass market for electric vehicles and delivering on our brand promise needed a breakthrough approach. Furthermore, it was clear that our current approach to launching vehicles would not provide the holistic approach needed to create the market for electric vehicles. 
In creating the EV ecosystem, Nissan has partnered with governments and utilities in the United States and around the world, including Sao Paulo, Toronto, Yokohama, and my homeland of Portugal. And it was during one of these groundbreaking partnerships where I first met Dr. Manuel Pino, Professor Pino, in June of 2008, when he served as the Minister of Economy and Innovation of the Portuguese government. I am indeed grateful that he has asked Nissan to be here today to demonstrate the progress we have made towards zero emission mobility. Today, I have with me a team of brilliant and passionate individuals who drove this innovation plan through multiple areas of the business. This approach ensured that we created a total solution for our customers, encompassing not only the vehicle, but the infrastructure needed to make zero emissions driving a reality. At Nissan, every vehicle is born in the design studio. The Nissan Leaf is no exception. To speak to you about the innovation that drove this design process, I welcome Alfonso Albaisa, Vice President of Nissan Design America in San Diego. Alfonso, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Tavares. Thank you, everyone. Um, this has been an amazing journey. I mean, as a, to be a designer as a way of life is really a kind of pinch me kind of thing. But when you're able to work on a project of this scale, this magnitude of collaboration, not only with the, my teammates here, but with governments and just with, with the dreams of, of the public, really, of how to get involved in, in changing the planet, it's been a real, real honor. So I want to take a couple of moments and go slightly Hollywood on you with a little film strip. Uh, so you get a feeling of just what is the life of a designer in general and what is the life of a designer inside Nissan. So of course the story has to start with maybe too much focus on mom, on the baby. And this focus and love really created a, a child that for the most part stayed within themselves. The kids are playing, the child is you know, drawing a big horse on the sidewalk, and as the kid grows up, the children, his friends are playing even harder, and he's really even more alone. But this sounds like a kind of sad story. But uh, this time alone, this time looking in, this time dreaming, really allowed us later when we um, went to college, first of all, it wasn't such a sad story because we found all these people who were quite similar to us, dreamers who spent most of their time somewhere floating in another world to then all together start to create. And great story that has a nice ending, but actually the ending became more interesting because as then when you get into a big company like Nissan, and especially the type of company where we, we see ourselves as bringing passion to the industry, you find that you work with product planning and engineers who share your passion, but their passion is in a different area. So we're floating in a cloud they're also as passionately making, wanting to make something real and something deeper. So our work actually became deeper and at the end of the day more real. And we've had the great honor to work on some really fabulous, fabulous projects. But this is one way. This is, if this, if life ended here, fabulous. But actually, around three years ago, there started to be some talk around and Trish and Mark about this fundamental change. I mean, electric vehicles have been around for a while, but the idea would land kind of flat. Everyone wants one, but there was no infrastructure. The time was just never right enough. But all these words, and at Nissan, we have our ears out. People are starting to talk. This is time. This is time. Mr. Goni is saying, I want to make this real. And everything started happening. And, and when we came and listened to these stories, fundamentally changed the way we design a car because of course, left on our own, we complete dreamland. We're in the sandbox in California, and we're thinking, okay, okay, we're going to make this ideal shape. When the wind hits the front, it moves around, and as it tapers out, effortless beauty. But, you know, kind of the reality is we want to make a real car for real people, and I think real people would feel a little embarrassed being in a 30-foot teardrop. And uh, actually making the corner around here, I think that'll be a little tricky. And uh, so we, this is where, you know, the job really starts to get interesting. The collaborations get deeper. 
and uh, we started looking at, okay, let's be the wind, and let's start to imagine how we can make the wind separate from the vehicle. We want it compact, we want it roomy, so you can drive around, you can have a wonderful life, you can enjoy the experience, but the wind must think it's leaving this form effortlessly. So on the rear end, as you can see, in the very beginning, we started playing with little elements that allow the wind to separate. Because what happens in uh, aerodynamics, as the wind flows through the car, great, but as it leaves the car, you don't want it to kind of come around the corner and basically holds the car, which in an electric vehicle burns battery, which you want to save. So these early experiments, we actually started thinking, oh, this is kind of interesting. This is a kind of new way of designing a car. And some things that started happening in collaborations, we found that as we're working the body side very smooth, the silhouette moving very smooth, that some tricks started to come up. Like, let's say for the, maybe we don't think about headlamps that much in our normal day. And, uh, but the headlamp itself, we discovered that if we create a shape that bulged up around the headlamp, it would separate the wind and actually bypass the side mirror. Well, okay, what's the big deal with that? Except an electric vehicle doesn't have an engine. It has an electric motor, which is dead silent. So when you're on the freeway, any little thing that's sticking out or in a weird shape creates noise, creates drag. So you had to get into these deep studies and go into the clay, go into wind tunnel, computer simulations of how the wind flows beautifully and effortlessly through the body of the car and creates no friction and no noise. So this kind of was a real big learning and I'm hoping that we can take this learning later into you know, all forms of our designs to make all of our cars super efficient. And as you can see, the leaf is starting to take shape. We want five passengers, this is a real car. We want sleek, effortless design. And um, at this point is when, as designers, we start thinking of some key words to finish the project. So this smart fluidity, that the wind, again, is the key, effortlessness is the key, and here we can then start to finish the car. And as designers, we start looking at all the little details, and let's just you know, make sure that the concept is all right with everyone and that we don't lose any of the benefits of the, the process. Some key elements that did stay, the rear, as you can see, stayed this little crease because it worked beautifully. The headlamp stayed high on the hood and off the surface, and it directs the wind away from the rear common, or from the side mirror. And also the, the lower of the car is completely cleaned up so that we can get, again, the wind flowing through the car. So that's a little story. Now, interior design, super critical. But on this car, it's almost like I have to tell another story because when you drive the first prototype around two years ago, you realize that when you get in the car, you put it in forward gear, no sound. And this is fundamentally different. You hit a button to engage the car, basically, no sound. So we came, we came obsessed by this whole experience. This is a car that doesn't act exactly or doesn't respond exactly like a car. So when we were thinking, okay, we're going to really, let's see if we can create this sense of peaceful harmony in the general environment. And because it is an EV, we wanted these very simple human flow. So the, when you're in, you're almost like a cloud, peaceful, and the car is not making any noise. And, uh, but then we really need to have some high tech uh, symbolism because this is an EV. It's very high tech. It has communications. You can communicate with your car. And we wanted all these elements to be shown in the design. So at the end of the day, the design was very simple has some high-tech elements. We concentrated very much on how clear we can give this information because it's new information. It's not gas I have left, it's how much range. Where's the, next, where's the next place for me to get a charge? So every simple message stated quite clearly. And one of the most important elements is, as I mentioned, this is completely different experience. So why have a shifter? So we worked very hard on how's the interface between when you get in the car, turn it on, put it into forward movement. So the, even the, 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 sh the shift area, drive-by wire, is completely a new experience. 
So, I mean, today I've been kind of talking about the design, but the design is not the full story because it's the people, the time, and uh, Trisha is the perfect person to explain that to you. For years, we've been hearing people and the public talking about need for environmental conservation, for recycling programs, things like that. But the truth is, is it's only been the last few years that we've started to see people actually putting prioritization into environmental factors in their decision making on purchasing goods. So as we're bringing an electric vehicle to market, it's a wonderful technology, but we have to understand who is our consumer, what is it that they're looking for and prioritizing, and as a result, market research becomes a very important element for us. Who is this consumer? Also, with the new technology, you're talking not just necessarily about one consumer, but maybe multiple. And in fact, with a new technology, we know often early adopters are more willing to come in, pursue a new product, and then you have to sell later to a pragmatic majority, a mass market consumer. So who are they? And they differ. Our early adopter consumer for the Nissan LEAF is one that very much is open to new ideas, is the type of consumer that sees opportunities and says, why shouldn't I be doing this? This is an opportunity for us to make a difference, to become more green, and they embrace those things in their life. In fact, many of them likely already have adopted a healthy lifestyle, maybe purchasing organic foods, may have considered or put solar panels on their house, might have been some of the first Prius hybrid owners. And these people also, they're out there, they want to be seen as leaders. They're not going to be evangelistic, but they do want to definitely take action and be seen and noted for the actions that they're taking. And they do have a strong social network. They're very close, they communicate with each other very regularly. And the expectation is that companies need to be very transparent, honest, genuine, or they will identify it and uh, call us out on those types of things. So as a result, their needs for a vehicle, they're looking for something that's going to be distinguishing, help them really show their environmental act activities, something that's also still going to be smart and sensible for them. They still need a car that's going to work and function, but they are going to be willing to make some changes in their life to adopt a green technology that they believe in. And what we see now from these consumers is very clearly they see electric vehicles as the right technology for today. We do have some consumer research we're going to show you to help you hear it from their own words. I stopped eating meat when I was 14, and one of the big things was the impact it has on our planet. I would like to go further, you know, with my car and my home in the ways that I can. I want my kids to see that too, that, you know, this is the way to go. There's like six of us now that drive Priuses. It's really funny. I've probably gotten like 15 people to buy Priuses. An electric car to me is the right solution. I mean, like, why not, basically? It's fast, it's clean. Why are we not jumping onto them? They're just so much better. This is the wave of the future. I mean, you can hop on the bandwagon and hopefully other people will do the same and mm -hmm. make a difference. So our early adopter customer is the one who's going to be out there right now, one of the many reservations we have, purchasing the Nissan LEAF, bringing it into their household. And they're going to be a very key part of the experience for us because they will set the initial precedents and expectations for how this vehicle will integrate in their lives and what consumers should expect. But they're not going to be our mass market customer. That's not where we're going to get the future volumes we need for our economies of scale to truly make it an affordable car for them. So as a result, we have to look at our pragmatist consumer. This is the mass market consumer who thinks green, wants to be a part of it, but definitely is a lot slower to adopt. They're going to be much more calculated in their decision making, looking and evaluating what is out there. And they'll follow without any issue if it makes sense for them. But they have to be able to integrate the green elements into their lifestyle today. They're not going to be willing to adapt their lives to it. Recycling's fine, but they're not necessarily going to drive over to the recycling center. They're going to wait until it's on the curbside so they can just bring it out to the street. And they don't want those inconveniences. So when we look at their car needs, first and foremost, it's all about how does this integrate into their lifestyle. It has to be a practical car, absolutely meeting all their needs. They're not willing to make any compromises. So no inconveniences. That public infrastructure becomes a very important thing in terms of the charging. And once those needs are met, then they're willing to adopt a green technology, incorporate it into their lives. But they do want to see others take that first chance with it and prove out that technology. They need to know that it is a proven technology that they can rely on. And they think EVs are very likely going to be the solution for tomorrow. 
again, we have another video to help you get a feel for what this consumer. I don't get a lot of reviews typically for a product before I buy. I don't typically buy anything on impulse. Not the first to adopt because usually that's where all the problems lie. There's a lot of bugs. I wait because this is always a problem. This could only be a second car because, for instance, for me, this would be perfect for my job. But if I want to go to Maine, I'm in trouble. It'd take me a week and a half to get there. <laughs> I'm open to whatever is coming. I think it has to do all the things that my current car does for me. If it suddenly becomes a major element of planning in my life, I'm not going to do it. So while Nissan wants to be a leader in zero emissions, we need to be very cognizant that a lot of the consumers out there may not be at the same level we are. So we've done a lot of work and research to identify this, but we need to help work with the consumers to help educate them about key terms, like the difference between battery electric vehicle, range extended electric vehicle, those types of things, that we need to have a conversation with consumers, really having a dialogue where we're discussing, answering, and asking questions so that we can understand if this makes sense, and also leveraging third parties. Because while Nissan can communicate specifically about zero emissions and how important it is, it becomes far more credible of a communication if other people are involved as well, saying the same messaging, reinforcing the direction that we're going. So much more of that than the typical advertising of just put it on TV and here's your price point, come in and buy it. Also, we need to prove that technology is real. When people drive it, they know that this is a real car. So part of our marketing activities are going to go out to consumers. We have a tour going on right now, consumer test drives where they have a chance to drive it and then they can share those experiences via social media so others maybe who have not experienced it are still hearing from people about how real and credible the vehicle is for them. And we need to leverage our early adopters and our bleeding edge. These people are not only passionate about the technology for themselves, but as you heard, they want to influence others to also adopt. So if we can provide them with access to the vehicle, give them conduit and mediums that they can use to communicate to others, they're going to help convince the pragmatic majority that this is the right vehicle for them. So once we understand who the consumer is, then we really have to make sure that we've got the right product for them. So the consumer information is taken, product planning then works very clearly to identify what are the critical needs for the consumer, what are the nice to have elements, maybe also what things shouldn't be on there at all. And Mark Perry, our director of product planning, works as that interface with engineering, the functions within the sales and marketing group, and the consumer to identify what are the correct vehicle needs that we need, not only for our early adopter, but for the pragmatic majority customer as well. Mark? Thanks, Trish. I'm not really a doctor. I'm a psychiatrist. I've got dreamers in the design studio. I got early adopters who absolutely know for a fact what the heck you've been waiting for. You don't have an electric car out, should have been out 20 years ago. And then I've got the pragmatists that Trish just described who are absolutely, I'm not going to be first. This thing has to be real and I don't believe it until I see it on the street. So you got to be a psychiatrist. And then you got engineers who say, this is what we can do. All that other stuff is fine, but this is what we have to do because we have to actually build this car, get it to market, and make sure that it's a success. So that's what it's all about. But really, just a little bit of step back, and we just threw a bunch of information at you as far as range extended and hybrids and electric vehicles. Basic, we have to start with some consumers about, well, what is this technology and really what it's all about? We're all very familiar with gasoline-powered engines, right? A hundred years worth of infrastructure, cars, engines, you know, your dad worked on it in the, in the driveway. We all know that, but now all of a sudden we have new technology. Actually, an electric vehicle is pretty simple. It's got a battery, it's got an electric motor, and it's got a plug. That's it. The fuel source is pure electricity, comes out of the battery pack, that's it. Now everything else is some kind of blend. If you're not doing just a gasoline internal combustion engine motor car, then everything else is some version of a hybrid. But there's so many flavors of hybrids that they've had to come up with new names for them. So hybrids, you know, everybody knows what a Prius is. You kind of know what that is. That's a very small battery hooked up to an internal combustion engine motor. Pure, you know, hybrids like that, they can maybe do two miles on pure electric power. Everything else, you're, you're emitting CO2, you're burning gas, everything else. You kind of move down the continuum then to a vehicle that maybe has a little bit bigger battery, a little bit more range, until you get something called a range extended 
or an advanced plug-in hybrid. They both mean the same thing. The only difference is how far do you go on pure electricity before that gasoline motor kicks in and actually helps move you down the road. Or in some cases, actually is an on, it does book two things. It moves you down the road and actually as a generator, you know, think about that generator you have when there's an ice storm, you're trying to keep your lights on. It acts like a generator actually to produce energy to put back in the batter pack and go. So that's what all the rest of that stuff is. Pretty complicated, pretty expensive, compromises everywhere because if we're really trying to get rid of this, there's only one way to do that, electricity. Zero emission, no tailpipe, no gas, no oil, none, none of that stuff ever touches the car again. And that's what we set out to do. So the, ba the breakthrough was in the battery itself. Th don't think of batteries like you think of flashlight batteries or maybe what's in your laptop or your cell phone. That's technology of about 10 years ago. Batteries today now look like license plates. They're about that wide. They're about that thin, they're about that size. You stack those cells up to make up a module, have a certain amount of voltage. You do a bunch of those modules together to figure out how much do you want to do to actually make the car work, drive, and go the amount of range. You know, the engineering challenge is how many of those, what does it cost? You're hoping that Alfonso's team has made a very slippery car so it's going through the air very easily so you don't need as much energy. And then where do you put it? You guys may know Mini E. Well, what'd they do? Well, they gave up the back seat, they gave up the trunk, they piled all those batteries back there, and you, had, you took a four-seater and made it a two-seater. Well, that's not the mass market. So what we try to do is, again, find that shape that Alfonso gave us and then look at that battery pack and say, where could you put it? It's underneath the car. You're actually sitting on it. So right underneath the front seats, second row, and in the rear seats. So it's actually packaged. Think of um, about laptops. Just kind of pack them all up, stand them up, and that's what makes up the car, battery pack. 600 pounds, dead center in the car, no sacrifice to headroom, legroom, knee room, put two golf bags in the back, or a whole bunch of boxes. Completely functional, efficient design, and well packaged. The car itself, and just on one sheet of paper, what is it all about? It's a five-door hatchback. Uh, the EPA calls this midsize, and so does Hertz and Enterprise, but we call it a compact. Uh, you can't get five adults in the car itself. Uh, we've had six foot five guys, three across in the back seat. Uh, Tracy and I had a bet with a member of the House of Representatives, one of his staffers, not one of the representatives, one of the staffers, that you couldn't put three car seats across the back. Well, you can. Uh, we, won a, we won a steak dinner from her, so we're going to collect that next week. Uh, but you can, you know, it, that's the car really to make it functional and efficient. You see 90 mile an hour top speed up there. Again, consumers, especially those pragmatists, eh, this is just a glorified golf cart. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. It accelerates, 90 mile an hour top speed, and actually we've had in the last two weeks about 250 journalists from you know, Canada to Argentina up and down the entire Americas come drive the vehicle and they made me a liar. They hit 95. <laughs> so I said, you know, please, we don't, we don't condone speeding in the state of Tennessee, but uh, they did go out on the interstate and hit 95 miles an hour with four people in the car, so it, more than capable of doing that. Typical engineers, they always hold a little pad in reserve they don't tell you about. So the car does 95. You see 24 kilowatt hour battery on board. You know, people are going to start learning now about miles per kilowatt instead of miles per gallon. We don't have gallons. We have inf infinite number of range when you think about gallons of gasoline because we, no we don't have any. We have miles per kilowatt now. And then there's a lot of information technology loaded in the car, so you're going to have a much more personal relationship than your, with your vehicle than maybe you've had in the past. Why 100 miles worth of range? This is where the marketing challenge that Trisha's team is facing versus the reality, that's where they collide. 95% of us drive less than 100 miles a day. That's just fact. Perception-wise is we, go, we think we go farther. We're sitting in traffic for two and a half hours. We think that's distance. No, that's not distance, that's time. We only go 100 miles a day. The first naysayers then come up and say, ah, how about the weekends? Everybody travels and goes on trips on the weekends. Well, look at the data. Doesn't matter, weekday, weekend. Doesn't really matter that much. Then you start slicing that pie down because what we're trying to figure out is where that sweet spot is about how much range, battery size and cost, vehicle size. What's the right kind of mix of all those variables? Because they do tend to compete. 
almost three quarters of us go less than 50 miles a day. 27% of us go less than 10 miles a day. These are, this is just facts. You do this in Japan, same. You do this in Europe, same. You do this in China, same. We don't go that far every day. So now the, the jump is versus the what if, what if I need to go pick my boss up at the airport, you know, those kind of on-off trips, versus the fact is I don't go that far. So a vehicle with 100 miles of range meets my daily needs. It can be your primary car if you define primary as the one you use every day. Are you going to pull a boat behind this car? No. Are you going to go four-wheeling? No. It's not its purpose. Its purpose is your daily use car. But if you want more than 100, we're going to find ways for you to do it. We have an eco economy mode in the vehicle itself. That little shifter that Alfonso was describing. Very easily, another, another mode in the car itself. We add more braking. We're actually putting energy back in the pack. We change some things in the vehicle. We find ways to give you 10% more range. So as a driver, you know, what happens with miles per gallon in your fuel tank in your car? All it does is go down. Actually, you can actually add range to your vehicle as you're driving around with this car. Another thing that we work very closely with Alfonso's team plus purchasing is the vehicle itself. We thought of the vehicle holistically from a sustainability standpoint. It would have been enough to bring out a vehicle with 100 miles worth of range that was affordable and the first mass market electric car. That, we could have said, all right, done. You know, that's, that's enough for this trip. We'll wait for the next generation. But then we went into the car itself and said, how else can we make it sustainable? You saw in the first uh, commercial that we ran, the little, the little piece of Everything you see there in green is made up of recycled water bottles. So we took the material, used you can actually turn this stuff into fabric now, something that we'd never done before. So we actually had worked, we found out that it was actually being used in carpets. I mean, there's a lot of carpet made out of recycled materials now, but we hadn't actually turned it into seat fabric. So again, working with Alfonso's team, purchasing the engineering community for durability, how do we find ways to make a bigger story? So actually, 99% of the vehicle's weight is completely recoverable and recyclable. All those things you see there in the explosion diagram are all those parts that are either made out of recycled materials coming in or the ability to recycle coming out. Another little obstacle that we came up with, Alfonso was describing how quiet the car is. Well, then all of a sudden we started hearing about very concerned interest groups, pedestrians, parking garages, kids, visually impaired. These cars are quiet. I don't know they're there. Bikers, all of us with our earbuds, right, in our ears walking around between, you know, trying to cross the street here. They're dead silent. Notice I said dead. <laughs> Got to be careful. So we actually had to figure out both in the lab and actually do the in-field tests to figure out that we needed to make artificial sound. Now, some of you guys are MBA students, I understand. There is not going to be ringtones for your car. That's not the, you know, the big idea that somebody's going to, it's going to be regulated. But right now, we're ahead of regulations. We're going, we actually had to artificially make sound. Now, we put people on street corners, we put hats on them, earmuffs, you know, in February, driving cars back and forth in front of them so we could learn when they found where cars were. What was the sound? that was needed to be made, they could pick it up, and then how far away it was. And then we also learned as you age, frequency makes a big difference. You, you probably hear much better than I do at high frequency. So we had to change, even work on that. So the car makes noise, zero to 18 miles an hour, then it turns off. We learned that enough tire and wind noise going by that you didn't need it after that point. But again, another little challenge that we had, bringing the car to market. Lots of information in the car, um, again, on the psychiatry side. Range anxiety is a, is a phobia only if you don't have information. You're worried about something, you don't have the information, you worry about it, you have anxiety. We have, a, we have all kinds of technology in the car to tell you range, energy usage, distance to empty, everything that you need to do. Right down to just, you know, push a button on the steering wheel, up pops on your nav screen, reachable area. You don't have to sit there and calculate, do I have enough range to make it? Push a button, car tells you. It's telling you, autumn, every, and it updates as you drive, and it constantly changes so you know where you are, so you don't have any anxiety. We believe technology is the pill. Dr. Phil was going to have a show, but I think it got canceled because he saw what we did in this car and kind of gave up. We've got to have apps. You're going to have a personal relationship. Um, again, just on your phone, you're going to be able to talk to your car. You're going to be able to understand. It's plugged in the parking garage out there. You're sitting in class going, okay, I need 50% state of charge in order to get home. 
dial up your car and ask it, well, where are you? Well, I'm at 47%. I need a couple extra minutes before I'm ready to go. You're plugged in at home. You know, all of us plug in, plug in these things, right? That's how we live. We get home, we plug these things in. Well, if you happen to forget your car, plug in your car, and you know, we had that from consumers. Well, what if I wake up in the morning, I forgot to plug my car, and I can't get to work? Okay, real concern. You know, dog ate my homework. I get that. Um, car's going to send you a text or an email and say, hey, you forgot to plug me in. You can sit here, you know, those cold mornings in February. Instead of using battery power to heat up the car, you'll actually be able to dial up your car and say, hey, warm it up to 75 degrees before I get in using grid power versus battery power. You know, flip that around, it's July and it's 90, cool it down. You'll be able to do that from, from your phone. So all those things are there, and again, that kind of relationship now that the car now is another device that you have that kind of interconnectivity and able to do that. But then we have the pragmatists. You know, all that stuff's cool for the early adopters. You know, it's all great. You know, it's the stuff you talk about to your friends. And you know, look, at this, look what my car can do. It's got a solar panel on it, you know, all those things. But now you've got the pragmatists that are going to do the math. So the whole point of the pricing position that we took with the vehicle and the, the difference between gasoline and electricity is where we wanted to make sure there are no premiums involved in, in using this car. Hybrids suffered because of price premium. You had to pay two, three, five thousand dollars more to drive a hybrid than you had to drive a, a regular gasoline car. With this, same or less. No payback period. Just look at the math. You spend on an, an annual basis, you spend driving around, you know, 25 miles a gallon car, three dollar a gallon gas, you spend about 12 cents a mile just to drive around. Just the math. Drive electric, you're under three. You look at those numbers on the screen, $1,800 a year to drive gasoline, less, you know, $396 to drive electric. So those guys that are the pragmatists are doing the math going, hmm, I'm saving money doing this. Oh, yeah, it's green, yeah, it's zero emission, yeah, 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 but I'm saving money. That's what they're interested in. Number one reason why they're interested in the car, save money. Number two, number three, is some version of green, sustainable, zero emission. But number one reason is I'm going to save money. They are the pragmatists. So we got a pretty unique car, pretty innovative. You know, we set it out you know, to make, it, make a statement with the vehicle, but we had an existing sales process that needed to be changed. And we needed to get a sales process to change as innovative as the car is. And Dave Mingle's gonna stand up as the head of our customer management office to actually show you what we did to actually change the entire experience on the consumer side to get one of these. Thank you, Mark. Now you understand why we call him the doctor. We should pass out order forms right now. Psychiatry. I charge very, very cheap rates. Very, oh. very cheap. Well, at a minimum, I think you should know by now how special this car is going to be. And we knew from the start that a special car was going to need a very special sales process. So what we did first, like all good marketing people do, is we went out and talked to our customers. How should we bring this car to market? Here's what they told us. Educate me about everything, especially those early adopters. They want to know everything about the car. Absolutely no surprises, full transparency about all of the capabilities of this car. They want us to make it easy for them, put it all in one place, easy to read formats, and keep them informed as new information becomes available. This is an evolving marketplace. It's an evolving technology. Things change all the time. They want us to make sure that we're the ones taking the responsibility to push information out to them so they can stay informed. And importantly, respect them. Respect my time and interest in your company. Why do we need to listen? Real simple. The EV value proposition, as should be pretty obvious by now, is totally different than that from a gasoline car or even a hybrid car. Things like charging infrastructure, driving range, mobile connectivity, how are you going to use that cell phone to communicate with your car, and tax incentives, which Tracy will talk to you about next, are all unique aspects that a customer has to know about to make an informed decision to buy this car. If we don't take the responsibility to inform them, at a minimum they can be confused, and worst case, they become dissatisfied owners, which I'm pretty sure, Carlos, is not in my job description. Let me give you an example. Who knows what an EVSE is? 
Mark, I thought we'd have at least one hand come up. But don't worry, I didn't know what it was about a year ago either. It's the electric vehicle service equipment, or what we call a charging dock. This is what you're going to have in your garage or available to you out into the public to charge the car. It's 240 volts, same as your clothes dryer, but will require permitting and professional installation. Second question for you. How many have tried to pull an electric permit? Ever? Well, it's not going to be a very pleasant experience for you if you try to do it by yourself. That's why we have taken it upon ourselves to line up a whole network of installers to be able to do that for our customers so this process can be very seamless and easy for them. So how do we pull this off? We created what we call the LEAF customer journey, the LCJ. It's a place where our customers can come and learn everything they need to know to decide if the Nissan LEAF is right for them. They'll be able to shop, including configuring a car that we will in fact build for them to their exact specification, including their desired color. It's a place where they'll be able to reserve and actually place a vehicle order online with the dealer of their choice. Ultimately, when the car becomes available for them to pick up, they'll be able to arrange delivery with one of our local dealers to take delivery of the car and take it home. After they have it home on the LCJ, we're going to have a full range of ownership tools off of our owner portal, including additional mobility apps, as the ones Mark already showed you. And a big breakthrough for the industry. We're going to do this with no dealer stock. Our plan is to sell 100% of our production before we ever ship the vehicle to uh, one of our dealers. So you can visit one of our dealers and you'll see lots of great cars like our Nissan Maxima, our flagship car for the Nissan brand, but you will not see a Nissan LEAF. So how are we doing so far? We've had over 5 million unique visitors to the Nissan LEAF microsite since we opened it up about a year ago. Over 250,000, I think the number as of this morning, Carlos, is 252, have now signed up as what we call hand raisers. They have provided us, at a minimum, an email address so we can stay in, in constant contact with them and push to them some of that information I talked about earlier and that Mark described. We have about 20,000 folks that have played a $99 reservation fee to be among the first in their marketplace to order the vehicle when it goes on sale. And we have about 3,000 folks that have already placed appointments for one of our EVSE installers, our charging dock installers, to come by their house and give them a quotation for what it's going to take to have that equipment in their garage. All of these numbers far exceed what we expected at this point. In fact, back in September, we actually shut down the reservation system because we were that far ahead of our initial uh, goals. So with that, I'd like to turn it over with, uh, to Tracy, who's going to talk to you about how we're going to bring public charging infrastructure to life. <laughs> to life. Uh, we hope so. So we've designed the car. We know who we're going to sell it to. We know what's going to be in it. We know how we want to sell it to them. So how are we going to reach outside the company to do that? When your goal is establish zero emission leadership, what do you need to do? You create a cross-functional team within the company. You get the government affairs lobbyist um, to help you reach out to these localities, to these utilities, to those states, to help you try to create public infrastructure. So we created a cross-functional team with a lot of people that I had never worked with before in the company. Um, so this was a very unique experience for me to actually work on a vehicle instead of just policy. So where are we going to start? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to start selling these cars? Where are we going to start creating public, public infrastructure? So we had to look at a list of how to layer our roadmap to where we're going to go. So we looked at hybrid registrations. Where are those current early adopters now? We look for places where there are already incentives in place. Oregon already had an incentive in place. Where were the things left over from the first go round with electric vehicles? You research green rankings, city rankings, places that have sustainability plans already in place. And then we used 20 years worth of networking and connections to try to open doors for us. Who do we go talk to? So with all of that, we were able to see where we needed to go first. And obviously the West Coast was on the top of our list with that. We also decided that we were going to take a different approach to this. 
we were going to try to do this very holistically, and we were, we were going to try to do it very personally. So there has been a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention to this. Between Mark and I and a few others, we've collected over 1,400 business cards, which represent 27 states and 308 cities. We've done countless presentations and, and webinars. So what you've heard today is two and a half years worth of him getting his story straight. Slow learners, slow learners. <laughs> we've, in addition to the consumer tour we are doing now, we've also done two prototype tours. Our last one hit 27 cities and 67 stops. So we have really reached out and touched a lot of people personally. And we think it's made a big, big difference. So what are we talking to these people about? We're wanting them to get plug-in ready or EV ready. And, but what we mean by that is incentives for customers, not for Nissan, not for other OEMs, but for the customers, financial incentives, tax rebates, tax credits, or things like free parking, HOV lane access, anything that will create an incentive for a customer to want to buy our car. What Dave talked about, we want to streamline that permitting inspection process so it's as short as possible. We'd like to get it down to three to five business days. Worst case scenario is you get your car, have to wait 68 weeks to get your home charging dock. We don't want that to happen. So our target is three to five business days. Things we run into, municipalities and states have local rules, so everybody's in charge of their own system. So we've tried to create a best practice self-inspection, online permitting, different ways that you can go about streamlining this process. Charging infrastructure. They know, locals know their areas better than we do. Where are those iconic locations where you can put charging? Where, as a public um, municipality, can you put charging in your own lots? Where can you put it on street maps? So people will know it's there. Don't need a lot to start out with, but you do need a level of some to make sure that people know it's there and they can charge if they need to. Education and public outreach, things like we're doing today, educating people, it's coming, it's real, we have to get ready. It takes a year, you know, everybody working together. So that's what we've been trying to do. The utilities, we've been trying to work with the utilities. We're sharing a customer now. We have to reach out to them. We don't want to be a pain point for them. We have to be able to work together with the utilities to make sure that they were promoting home charging at night. We don't plug in at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when it's very hot outside and cause problems for the grid. So when you're plug-in ready, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to have your utility, you're going to have your retail lot like a Best Buy or a Home Depot or something with charging in it. You're going to have charging stations along the street, in parking lots, and in your house. So we envision that this is what an EV ecosystem would look like. And this is what we need to work toward. And these are just some more examples. Dave showed you our home charging dock that's in the middle, but there's some other examples, DC fast charge, other street parking. The upper right is actually the highway sign for the states of Oregon, states of Washington, and, and California for you to be able to know where you can EV charge or in the cities and then along the highways. There are currently 106,000 gas stations with convenience stores in the U.S. as of July of this year. By the end of next year, there's going to be 13,000 level two public charging stations. That does not count the number of home charging stations that people will be putting in, and it does not count the number where there will be, our dealers will have them available as well. So you can see these are going to proliferate really quickly. Um, we, Department of Energy, one of the things we've been working on with them is this sort of thing with the public charging. This is a result of our two and a half years worth of work. July of 2008, we announced our MOU with the state of Tennessee. Didn't really count. Home, home field advantage, right? Corporate headquarters is there. Manufacturing is there. Not a big deal. November 10th, 2008, we announced our partnership agreement with the state of Oregon. That was a big deal. Green state eco-friendly, really opened a lot of eyes. We didn't have to knock on doors as hard then. People started knocking on our doors. This is the result of that. We've uh, had people reach out to us. This morning, we met with Seward Park Free Market Cooperative, largest free market cooperative in the city of New York. Wanted to talk to us about EVs. Wanted to talk to us about how they can help 
Where do they need to put charging stations? How do they need to get people together to do that? We spent an hour with them this morning. And in doing all this, Nissan is becoming a policy leader, not only on the federal level, but on the state level as well. People are calling us, wanting to know what they can do to help, wanting to make sure they're not a barrier, wanting to see what they can do to help promote advanced technology vehicles. So this has been a game changer for Nissan in that regard too. We've always been a little bit of a maverick, but the EV has really brought us to the forefront of being a maverick. Um, so we are involved in many places that we can. There's only a few of us that are uh, government affairs. We've deputized all of these people up here to do so as well. But this is where we come full circle. When we start delivering vehicles in December, we will have come full circle with our two and a half years of work. And now to close this out on our circle, we're going to turn it back over to Mr. Tavares. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, team. Um, let's wrap up. Uh, let's wrap up um, uh, everything which was uh, mentioned and perhaps start with the fact that uh, the team has now taken you through how Nissan has transformed the vehicle launch process to meet the demands of the consumers the opportunity of new technology and changing needs of the society. We believe this approach not only will be benchmarked within the industry, but also will become an industry standard. Uh, we have made great efforts to get to this point, and yet we are convinced that this moment is only the beginning. In December, you'll see uh, the first of several all-electric vehicles on the roads, and in the driveways of people on three continents. By 2014, two more electric vehicles will join Nissan's product portfolio, an electric commercial vehicle, which will bring emissions free driving to the world van sector, and a compact Infiniti electric vehicle, the first EV in the luxury segment. Alfonso uh, talked to you about the innovative design philosophy of the Nissan LEAF, but imagine a world where vehicles can be any shape thanks to the unique packaging abilities of an electric vehicle. Trisha shed light on our customer profile. The more customers experience zero emissions, the closer we will get to a vehicle ownership experience that's both guilt-free and anxiety-free. The future of product features is wide open. Mark shed light on features such as the vehicle quietness, but imagine a world where the quiet whir of the road is all that's heard on the highway. Policymakers and utilities today are working in tandem with the automotive industry in places around the country that Tracy highlighted, but imagine those communities joining together. So it's possible to shape zero emission roadways connecting population centers throughout the United States. And it's doubtful that consumers will want to return to the old way of buying a vehicle after experiencing the white gloved service and online convenience that comes with the journey of buying a Nissan Leaf that David outlined for you. Are we being too idealistic too optimistic, perhaps. But should we continue to work towards the creation of a zero emission society? We think absolutely. In closing, keeping with our brand promise, Nissan will continue to push the limits of the automotive industry long into the future with the concept of innovation as our core belief. We hope many of you joining us for this exciting journey. And together, let's try to make these things a thing of the past. So, would you like the opportunity to drive a Nissan Leaf? Thank you. Right now, we will host a mobile Q&A contest for three students to win the exclusive opportunity to drive the Nissan Leaf here in New York City. In a moment, we will post three multiple choices questions you must text the response to. Three students will be selected from those who answer all the questions correctly. Get out your phones and good luck. 
You can text your responses to the questions on the screen to 69302. And now we look forward to answering your insightful and I'm sure challenging questions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so the first one, here we go. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Ali Shishwa from Columbia University. Thanks for the presentation. The strategy aspect was quite interesting on both sides, both the marketing and the planning part. Um, I had three quick questions. Um, the first one is how much, in terms of RD&D budget, does that project represent for Nissan, or an order of magnitude, to get a sense of how you're de developing that compared to the other costs, because you mentioned that you don't have them in source. Um, the second one is what exactly does the MOU contain with the states, because you mentioned the different aspects, but it'd be interesting to see from the different states how they perceive and what they include in the MOUs. And the third part is a lot of the things that we saw were about the US, um, but EU is tend to be more environmentally friendly. So why this focus in the US, or are you developing that thing on the EU as well? Thanks. Thank you. We'll try to answer your three questions. Uh, I'll take the first one. I'll ask um, uh, Tracy to take the second one, and uh, probably I'll come back to the, to the third one. Uh, R&D, you know that uh, Nissan has uh, another strength that we didn't talk so much about it today is, is the alliance with Bruno. And uh, this, is a, this is a very important thing because it gives us a foundation, much broader foundation, uh, to share uh, the R&D costs and, of course, the investments of this a significant uh, strategic decision. So we have been doing this uh, since day one, uh, both in terms of R&D and in terms of manufacturing investment. To make it simple, we have invested already more than 4 billion euros uh, in uh, zero emission uh, vehicles. This uh, embraces R&D and manufacturing. Uh, I will perhaps give you a few more numbers so that you have some references. Uh, at this stage, the Alliance has already invested for half a million uh, battery capacity per year. Uh, we have already invested for uh, more than 250,000 electric vehicles per year. And I can tell you, we are the only ones. We are the only ones that took this magnitude of uh, commitment to the zero emission strategy. So it's, it's, it's money, it's big money. But at the same time, it's not uh, disproportionate. Uh, you, you can calculate uh, what represents the, the, total, uh, the total amount of um, investment that we do on a, on a yearly basis. A company like ours is 4.5% of turnover, and you'll see that this, this magnitude represents perhaps a little bit more than the total investment we do uh, in, uh, in one single year. So it's, it's reasonable, and the fact that we have uh, this partnership with Renault makes, makes it even more powerful moving forward, both on the R&D side and on the manufacturing side. On the uh, R&D side, one thing I would like also to highlight is that this is not the story of a car. As you heard, it's a story of bringing a full portfolio of vehicles. And you know that both Renault and Nissan now have in the pipe uh, eight electric vehicles. And that's uh, going to be, of course, a competitive edge for both companies. So Tracy, would like to answer the second one? Sure, I'd be glad to answer. When we started this out, we were operating blindly as well. Um, so when we started approaching these places to have the initial memorandum, memorandums of understanding, what we wanted to the, with them was a formalized agreement. It was non-binding. Um, what it was doing was bringing the interested parties together to roll up our sleeves, to sit down and work together to figure out what we all needed to do. Um, we needed to roadmap the permitting inspection process. How many days does it take? How short can we get it? And look at public charging. What laws need to be changed? Are there opportunities for incentives? Some states were a little bit more aggressive than others. Some already had things in place and we didn't have to do that. But by and large, when we started these partnership agreements, it was more of a formalization of our working together. Um, and it also was a uh, marketing opportunity because the announcement of these partnerships 
created press, it created buzz, it started creating the perception that this was really a movement, which it was. Um, so different ones had different things, they're all about the same, you know, you start looking at those things that we wanted them to do to be market ready, and it was laying out the roadmap for how we were going to get there. Thank you, uh, Tracy. I'll take the, the third question and I'll make the transition. You know, we, we thought, perhaps we were wrong, that we should focus more on the United States today. But this is a worldwide strategy. Uh, that's very clear. And uh, to, to use the MOU question, uh, one of the commitments that we were looking for uh, when we worked with governments, and I'll take here the example of, of Portugal, where this was uh, discussed and uh, uh, agreed with uh, Professor Pinho at that point in time, was the commitment from the government that they would install a certain level of uh, uh, density of charging units because we were mindful of the customer experience and we didn't want to bring the car if there was no infrastructure. So one of the major uh, pillars of those MOUs was the commitment from uh, the official entity that a certain number of charging units would be there uh, and of course from our side the commitment that we would bring the car uh, in a timely manner. Uh, in Portugal for instance there were multiple uh, local agreements between the government and the 25 major cities of the country so that they would install those charging units with a, a certain number of milestones. I remember there was one by the end of uh, 2010 and another one by the end of uh, 2011. So that's one of, the, one of the examples. In Europe we have multiple partnerships. We have uh, partnerships uh, with the uh, UK, we have partnerships with Denmark, with Ireland. Uh, of course we are uh, also working with a lot of prefectures in, in Japan, in Yokohama, uh, and across the country. We have discussions uh, ongoing uh, in China. We also uh, signed MOUs in Australia. Uh, in the Americas, we have MOUs agreements with Toronto, with Quebec, with Vancouver. We have uh, uh, an agreement with Mexico City. Uh, there will be, uh, in November, a very important World Mayor Summit where all the mayors of big cities come to Mexico City to discuss what they can do to accelerate the uh, proliferation of electric vehicles. We have an MOU with the city of Sao Paulo. Uh, so, you know, it's, we have an MOU with Chile. Uh, it's, it's a worldwide strategy, and we, for the sake of simplicity, we just thought that we should focus on the U.S. today. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, just two brief questions. The first one is: Do you guys have any data on the net emissions saved? I mean, uh, you did some data with the, the cost, but I'd be interested to see if you know taking like the world energy mix or even the U.S. energy mix, the power mix of uh, how much emissions would would it would it take to charge your car uh, as compared to the emissions um, uh, given off from burning oil? And the second question is: Is I found it interesting about the 95% of consumers, but I'm definitely part of that pragmatist group. And that last 5%, I'm sorry, the 95% of consumers who drive less than 100 miles, that last 5% I think is huge. Um, you know, I, I just took a weekend trip to Boston. If I owned a Leaf, I wouldn't be able to get there in a car. Uh, so what are you guys doing in the future, you know, future innovations, like whether expanding the battery, expanding the mileage range, uh, maybe possible vent joint ventures with, you know, anything with providing oil burning cars for a weekend, you know, um, you know, using like a Hertz or something or using other Nissan cars that that leaf consumers can uh, can, can utilize. Thank you. Thank you for your your question, especially the second one or even the first one, because we love uh, being challenged and you are absolutely correct uh, in highlighting those two points. So I'll take the first one uh, and probably ask uh, Dr. Mark to answer the second one. Um, so, first one is an is important topic, and this is a, a topic that uh, Professor Pino knows very well, so he can also jump in uh, if, he, if he, he thinks it's necessary. Uh, you know, we used to, to talk about the well-to-will uh, energy consumption, and for the sake of the explanation, I would like to break it down in well-to-tank and tank-to-will. So, uh, we, as a car maker, consider that it is our responsibility to address the tank to wheel, which is the mobility device. So from a tank to wheel perspective, from a mobility device perspective, we have now a solution. Not a smaller, a smaller car, a real solution because it's zero. No tailpipe, no gas. 
Then you have the wheel to tank, which is how you provide the energy and what's the footprint uh, of, that, uh, of that energy in terms of, uh, of carbon. Uh, as we know, uh, a lot of countries have different footprints. As you know, there is a worldwide uh, dynamic to go in the direction of renewable energies. And as you know, the starting point of those countries is different. But what is very important is that everybody is somewhere moving in the same direction. And you know that uh, if I take two examples uh, in, in, in the Americas, I would say that both Brazil and Canada have more than 90% of renewable energy rate. Portugal is now moving from 40 to 70. I believe Denmark is in the high 70s also. So all of these uh, countries and all of these societies understand that renewable energy is the direction and they will work in their own footprint uh, of, um, of uh, energy uh, sourcing uh, to improve uh, that, uh, that uh, performance. So when you combine well to tank and tank to wheel, you are moving to a low carbon overall society. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, what we are doing. And then you can uh, spend a lot of time making calculations on uh, why uh, in this country uh, an electric vehicle will gain more uh, tons of CO2 than in another country. Uh, and you can also understand why in the United States we selected some specific markets uh, to launch the Nissan Leaf because in those markets the footprint of energy production is much more uh, green or renewable than in other states. So that's the answer to the first part of your question and I will let uh, Mark talk about uh, the anxiety of not being able to go on weekend. I mean, the, in, you, you raise a very good question. And again, the, you, you layer in now, nine, the fact is 95% of us go less than 100 miles a day, a day. So that, what's your primary car? You layer in then that there are 12 million cars and trucks, new cars and trucks sold every year. We're not trying to sell all 12 million cars and trucks to be EVs. Another information about the United States, multiple car households. We, we have multiple cars for multiple uses in general. People who buy new cars, they typically have two to three cars in the household, designed for specific instances. This car is designed to be your daily car, not the car to go to Boston, yet, yet. You have something else. Now, what is the something else in the interim? The something else in the interim could be car sharing. Hertz is, going to, is announcing a car sharing program, similar in concept to Zipcar, but a little different now through a rental car agency. Uh, and they're going to be live here in New York, so it's another alternative. So again, as you look across the, the consumer base, the first thing is that people have multiple cars already. So that's what they use to go to Boston. If you don't, then you avail yourself of something else. And that something else could be car share, could be a used car, could be something else. Now, long, long, long term, is there a battery breakthrough in the future? Gosh, I hope so. There's about two and a half billion dollars just in the United States in research and development going, and not just not Nissan funding, but just funding from lots of various sources. So a lot of people are working on it. It's not there yet. A 200-mile battery is just not there yet. Uh, but there's a lot of funding to continue to do research. And my crystal ball is not that good, you know, eight to ten years from now. There'll be something, just not yet. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Oh. Okay, um, thanks for giving us a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, my name is Xiao Jing, first year MIA. There are two things that I would like to know more about. First is about um, the infrastructure problem. Since Nissan is not the only one that's building you know, electrical vehicles right now, there are also companies working on it. So as a consumer, I would want like, standardized uh, infrastructure in the charging stations, right? For example, you know, the, the um, standardized plug-in connector or the power supply or like standardized battery. So my question is, uh, does Nissan plan to you know, partner with other uh, automobile companies to uh, have this standardized, uh, standardized, um, plug, uh, standardized infrastructure or does it plan to you know, build this standard on its own? Uh, so, and my second question is, I think actually, uh, do, you, do you guys have any specific plan to open up the market in China? Because I think it's actually a better one because the demand is really high and it's really easier to you know, build the infrastructure with the centralized government. 
And the third, <laughs> <laughs> and the third is that you know in big in big city, uh, most people, uh, most uh, vehicles are in big cities in China, so people don't really drive as far as Americans do. So uh, it actually lowers the requirement for battery, right? So I want, I would like to know what do you guys plan to do in China? Thank you. Great questions. Thank you for moving us uh, east or west, depending on which perspective you take. But uh, I will take um, the opportunity through your uh, thoughtful questions to introduce um, Eric Nozier. He's our vice president of corporate planning and, and programs. He's uh, also a very important uh, actor in all the discussions we, are, we have been having. So I will ask Eric and, and Tracy, perhaps, to answer your first question about how are we positioning ourselves against standardization. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning, everyone. Um, these are very good questions, and of course, we are not trying to do it on our own. We are working on standardization. Uh, what uh, David was showing you in terms of EVSC, uh, already the connectors are standardized. It's uh, the, 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 the 240 volts plug that you, you bring in your car is, is a standard already in the US. We didn't really touch base on the, the quick charge, which is 480 volts. These are bigger quick uh, charging stations. The standard doesn't exist yet, but we are working with the SAE. Uh, to, uh, to try to standardize that. You have a few uh, auto, automakers such as Mitsubishi, uh, Ford, GM, all working together to, uh, to suddenly uh, develop a standard in the US. Europe would be a different story and uh, China would be, a, would be a different story as well, of course. Um, in terms, I don't know what, Tracy, you want, you want to add a anything on, on that part? Uh, no, and there are, there are national associations like uh, EDTA, Electric Drive Transport Association, that all of the OEMs are members of that are starting to work on that. I think in the beginning, those people who the infrastructure is most important to are out there working. You know, the, the, the things that we've been doing not, are not exclusive. We don't want what happened in the late 90s when there were two different standards to be out there. So Eric's right, there's one standard for the coupler. The Society of Automotive Engineers has gotten all the OEMs to agree that they will have that same coupler. So any public infrastructure that's out there will be universal. So that's gonna be a big hurdle that we've gotten over. And I will answer your question about China. Uh, first, to tell you that we already have a certain number of MOUs signed with, uh, with Chinese uh, cities. So we are there, as you know, we, we have a, a very uh, important presence uh, with uh, now more than 6% market share in China and a very good uh, partner with uh, Dongfang. And uh, we have significant activity over there. Uh, and for the sake of letting those discussions proceed properly, I will not tell you more today. But we are, we are working hard uh, in China. And you are absolutely correct that there is um, in China the same, I would say, profile as the one that Mark highlighted, which is 95% of the people don't drive more than 100 miles. And one thing which is interesting is that China, because has a shorter, I would say, automotive history as the concern of shortcutting a certain number of intermediary steps and go directly to, uh, I would say, cleaner uh, mobility uh, devices. So I'm very um, uh, hopeful that we are going to progress very quickly over there also. Uh, and that's all I can tell you today. But certainly it is in our radar screen. We have sig significant activity over there. And we believe that we can bring something to some of the big uh, Chinese cities as much as we intend to bring something to some of the cities that perhaps face the same issues like Mexico City or Sao Paulo. Thank you. Monsieur Tavares and team, thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. Uh, my name is uh, David. I'm a master's in public administration, finishing up in the spring. And my question is about um, how the electric car can interface with renewable technology moving forward. So uh, one of the biggest hurdles to wind power and solar power is the intermittency. A cloud comes over or the wind stops blowing, and you need to have a, a gas turbine to pick up that slack. And some thinkers have um, posited that electric vehicle network could not only uh, receive electricity from the grid, but then also feed it back in and be a, a, a power source across the country. So does that capacity exist now or moving forward? Uh, is that something you're looking forward to? Great question. Um, let me introduce and then, and then uh, perhaps ask Mark and Eric to, uh, to complement. Um, we, we are very mindful of the fact that we need to close the loop on the battery uh, life cycle. Uh, we imagine that there is 
uh, an automotive life, life, life cycle and then a non-automotive life cycle just after. And of course, this non-automotive life cycle, life cycle has a huge potential to positively interfere with the lifestyle of our consumers mm -hmm. and, and, and mostly to the energy supply of their home. So we, we created a partnership with a company, Japanese company called Sumitomo to address the four, what we call the four R's. Uh, and I'm, of course, I'm going to uh, forget one, so I'm not going to mention those four hours, but they will. <laughs> but the purpose is exactly to see how we translate this technology on something else than just the mobility device as an energy supply to the livelihood or to the uh, lifestyle of the consumers within their, uh, their home. So Eric or Mark, who wants to start? Um, maybe I can start, and uh, I'm going to try to be brief because it's a very wide subject, of course. And uh, thanks for the question. The first application, for instance, when you think about uh, wind energy at night, you've got wind, you don't know what to do, you can't store it. Now you've got the car in a, in a, in a home that you want to recharge, so you can basically defer some wind energy directly to the, to, to the cars. The sun, for instance, would be more appropriate during the day. And it's very clear that we are also working um, with some um, solar panels or, or solar inst in installer to offer potentially a sustainable cycle. So you're gonna buy the Nissan Leaf at the dealership, but some people would also love to, to equip their homes with solar panels and so on. So what, this is a natural partnership in terms of a sustainability cycle. Uh, the, other, um, the other part of the equation is the FAR, as you were talking, uh, talking about, Carlos. FAR stands for recyclers, resell, refurbish, and remarketing the batteries. So it's the second life of the batteries. Uh, we're also talking to utilities, for instance. Some of them you know, never solved the, the problem of uh, energy storage. So now you have batteries which after uh, five years still have a lot of capacity or durability. They can be used for storage capabilities. So you can, you know, that would be a, a, a substitution to new power, power, power plants, for instance. You've got those batteries and then you, you can charge during the day or during the night. You charge the batteries and then it allows you not to have a peak during the day. And I guess the peak is around 20%. So we have 20% over capacity in the US, for instance, in terms of uh, power supply. Therefore, you can, you can also cre uh, 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 sweep the, 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 the peak. And uh, it's, it's a lot of energy saving. So it's, it's also part of all the sustainability uh, problem and, uh, and solutions that we're bringing here with the, not only the car in the upfront, but also the storage uh, downstream. Thank you, Eric. By the way, Eric comes from uh, this university, just in case. Uh, so you can have a positive judgment of his answers. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thanks everybody. Um, my name is Luke. I'm a uh, MPA student in environmental science and policy here. Uh, I used to uh, sell Zap cars and uh, other neighborhood electric vehicles. And I would encounter these, uh, as you described, the pragmatic consumers every day. And the two questions I could count on getting every single day were range issues and then battery life issues. So my questions, they've kind of already been covered a little bit, but um, one, what is Nissan planning to do about, um, you speak a lot about the charging infrastructure, but what are you guys planning to do for uh, technological breakthroughs to really improve quick charging? Because, you know, charging off 110, that trickle charging takes hours. In my understanding, even the 240 volt charging still takes hours. But there are fast charging technologies that could charge um, cars, you know, in maybe 40 minutes or a half hour. Um, if we can speed that up, then we can pull into a gas station and, and charge our cars in 10 minutes, and, and then the range issue is basically solved. So what, what are you guys doing to address those technical hurdles? And then the other issue is, of course, the battery life, which was just talked about a little bit. But you know, every day they would, would say to me, well, what do I do when my batteries are dead and the car's no more used to me? What is Nissan doing to, to address those issues for the, for, um, for the real practical purpose of, of keeping these cars running for, for years and years? Let me start with the easy part of the answer, and the difficult part will be for Mark. So the, the easy part of the answer is that we are selling the car with the battery as one of the components of, of the car, or leasing the car with the battery. And when we sell the car, we are going to sell the car with a, a battery warranty of uh, eight years and 100,000 miles, which is a quite, uh, uh, I think, a wide, uh, wide warranty, so that we take that anxiety out of the mind of the consumer by saying, look, you have a wide warranty. It even goes beyond the warranty of the car itself. So it's, it's our our responsibility 
uh, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, it. We can give you a little bit more details uh, later if you want, but I, I would like to give Mark the opportunity to answer the other question about the fast charging. And that's exactly what we believe will help faster adoption is fast charging, um, and we're launching with that. So you'll see in um, six states, as we launch in, de in December and into next year, uh, the ability that the car will come st with a charge port that actually accepts 480 volt power, zero to 80% state of charge, 30 minutes. So plug in, it's a fire hose. You get, <laughs> you're not gonna, you probably won't show up at zero, so you're probably talking about your 10 minutes, yeah. you'll pick up 40, 50 miles, you're down the road and go. We're actually, you know, the work that, uh, Tracy's, Tracy and I have been working on at the state level, you'll see those pathway chargers. So we're going to connect places like LA, San Diego, San Francisco, Sacramento, Seattle, Vancouver, Portland, Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville. And we'll be put, city of Houston is going to be completely covered up with DC fast charging. So you'll see it. We're not nationwide yet, but we're absolutely going to do it. Thank you. Shall we uh, answer the Questions for the two gentlemen, or you want us to stop? So I'll try to go fast, please. Uh, thank you for coming today and delivering uh, this great presentation. Uh, my name is Martin Bachvarov. I'm a SIPA alum and currently working for Conet uh, Long-Term uh, Forecasting Group. Uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, after how bright is the future of electric vehicles after the election results this Tuesday? And uh, my second question is, uh, when you're going to see um, Electric version of Formula One races. Thank you. Wow. I think I'm going to take this too, no? <laughs> Great questions. Well, for the first one, I would say it's uh, uh, as bright now as it was a few days ago, uh, because this is driven by, by the consumer. Uh, the consumer is, uh, at the same time, the guy who decides uh, to buy or not to buy, and the guy who uh, also somewhere puts the pressure uh, uh, on the, uh, any government, any official uh, to address what the consumer thinks are the society problems. So I, I don't see any, any fundamental, fundamental difference. This is a very big, big uh, shift. It's a very deep uh, uh, trend. Uh, so I'm, I'm very comfortable uh, with, uh, with this kind of change. I think it's exactly as it was uh, a few days before. On the second question, uh, which is a, uh, also a great point. I think there is uh, a lot to do to demonstrate that uh, electric vehicles are fun. Because in the mind of a certain number of consumers, uh, first, electric vehicles are not a real car, which we are now demonstrating is wrong with the Nissan Leaf. And secondly, they are not fun. They cannot be agile, uh, which is also wrong. And uh, there are two, two kinds of people I can meet, the ones who did the test drive and the ones who didn't. And uh, the, was, the ones who did, they understand exactly what I'm saying. So motorsports uh, may happen, Formula One, I don't know. Uh, I think at the beginning, it's going to be a little bit shorter races, uh, given, uh, <laughs> given the capacity of the batteries. But I can tell you that uh, we have been doing significant work uh, on uh, what could be an interesting uh, leverage from a motorsports perspective of zero emission vehicles. And uh, it pencils very well. So I would like to ask you a few uh, months of patience so that uh, we can come back strong on that matter. But uh, we will do something about it. But certainly not from no one. Thank you. And the last question. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Shamik Bose. Um, my question is really regarding your growth trajectory for Nissan. Um, I want to know, you know, with the rapid growth led by developing countries, um, the consumers of tomorrow of today are necessarily not going to be the customers of tomorrow. So um, I wanted to know how you're going to position Nissan as a brand in the future. Are you going to, you in your presentations showed some signals of reducing margins and um, you know, increasing volume. So is that a strategy that you're looking to implement in the future um, as um, more and more people will be able to afford to buy a car, but will it be an electric car? Thank you. Perfect question for my closing, thank you. Extremely timely. You know, you, you are absolutely right. Uh, yeah, there are two things we are trying to do. The first one, uh, it's correct to say that Nissan has a growth strategy. Uh, uh, let me give you some, some figures. We, we just presented this week our first half financial results and we expressed the fact that uh, we are going to 
uh, grow significantly in this fiscal year, probably uh, close to 4.1 million cars. Uh, last year we, we sold uh, 3.5, and so far uh, the record year of Nissan was uh, 2007 with 3.77. So you see that we are stepping out of the crisis very strong, uh, probably to beat our sales record this year, uh, a company with no debt and a company that performed the 7.8% operating profit margin on the first half, which is the similar level as it was before the crisis. So we are back, and we are back very strong. Now, second part of the answer is about uh, the Nissan brand. And we have been saying that there is uh, something we need to uh, enhance is the explanation of what Nissan stands for as a brand. And this has been uh, one of the reasons why our presence in the United States, but not only, is not as large as it should be, because we didn't communicate clear enough what we stand for as a brand. So what is it? Uh, we have made significant research, and we came up with a very, uh, I hope, clear statement, uh, which is innovation for all. Our marketing uh, campaign and our brand statement is this one, innovation for all. And why? Because when you look at the products we have created in the last 10 years, if you look at them one by one, each of them represents in some specific form an innovation. Uh, and I could give you several examples. I can, let me give you just three examples. Uh, the Murano crossover concept was one of the first to be introduced. Uh, the Nissan GTR, a high-performance, very affordable car. Uh, the Nissan Juke with a, a new, very innovative uh, uh, powertrain uh, also. So th those are three examples. I could use other ones. So we end up by saying, well, it's very natural. It's very core. It's rooted. Nissan is about innovation. And it's also somewhere about affordability. So it's innovation for all. Now, within this brand statement, this is what we want to stand for. We want to own the territory of innovation. And we have a flag, and that flag is the Nissan LEAF, because the innovation power of Nissan LEAF is obvious, I believe, for everybody. So using the Nissan LEAF as the flag for innovation, we want to communicate that our territory is innovation, and it's innovation for all, because it's affordable. That's my answer. Thank you.